Umiak One is the lifeline to a remote nickel mine on Canada's east coast. And the mine desperately needs supplies. This ship has to get there. It's a never-ending battle, a warrior on board. Fighting through storms and swells, she'll return with a $100 million cargo. If something had to go wrong, you don't have a lot of money for air. Out here in the ice, Umiak One is on her own. Umiak One is the most powerful ice breaking bulk carrier in the world. Driven by the largest single engine in Canada, she sails just one route the 2,100 kilometers between Quebec City and the Voises Bay nickel mine in northeastern Labrador. From Quebec, she brings the supplies needed to sustain the miners and keep the mine working. Then she returns again, loaded with up to 30,000 tons of nickel concentrate, a haul worth more than $100 million. She makes this round trip at least once a month, no matter what the weather. Every journey is a heavy duty obstacle course for Captain Dean Rose. We're up here operating about uh, four or five months in the winter out of a year, so the guys are used to the cold, they don't mind it, and uh, they do a good job, a really good job. In 2006, Captain Rose was first officer on Umiak One's maiden voyage. Four years later, he was given command. Captain Rose hails from the rugged Atlantic Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and so does almost everyone else on board. It's nice to work with a, a bunch of guys from your own province. Uh, our accent, as you can tell, is, is, is pretty strong, so. Uh, we got no trouble to understand each other outsiders might have trouble. <laughs> All right, how you doing on forward, Ken? Umiak One sails in every season, but this is the most treacherous time of the year. The end of March is very unpredictable. It basically boils down to a day-to-day -day or an hour-to-hour -hour, uh, forecast. So uh, one minute it can be a uh, flat calm and the next minute it can be a uh, Gusting up to 35, 40 knots. It's 4 p.m. in Quebec City, just four hours before Captain Rose must leave on the five-day voyage. Are they going to start number three, Hatch? No. The person responsible for loading the 1,400 tons of cargo on board is Chief Officer Kent Waddleton. Uh, we want to get out of here on time. We want to. Take on her next perk so we can uh, proceed more. 2,100 kilometers away, 250 miners are waiting for these goods. Today, the ship is loaded with everything from frozen vegetables to diesel oil to cables to these 19 ton trucks. Stretching 189 meters. Umiak One is the queen of multitasking. She's an icebreaker. Her reinforced hull can crush ice ridges 10 meters thick. She's a bulk carrier. Her four holes can haul up to 30,000 tons of loose cargo, like minerals or grain. She's a mini oil tanker, able to carry 7,000 cubic meters of fuel to power the mine and her three cranes can load up to 152 containers on deck. This cargo needs to remain lashed down for the next four to five days. You got enough room to drive off? Yes, yes, we can drive off. We're to make sure it's well lashed because uh, we can get into some uh, rough weather. Post Labrador in the wintertime is be a nasty place sometimes. But you just going to back up a little bit. Okay. Whoa. We got a 19 ton back truck getting loose on deck. The crew starts hoisting aboard the last two loads. Just want to make sure it comes in smoothly, uh, doesn't bang into the container. 
but time is tight. The captain wants to cast off in just over 60 minutes. Down below, the engineering crew revs up the engine for the five-day voyage. Engine Rex. One hour's notice for departure. Okay, Martin, thanks. All right, bye-bye. We'll watch our temperatures and our pressures, make sure that everything's coming up uh, evenly. On land or sea, this is the largest single engine in Canada. With 30,000 horsepower and seven cylinders, it measures nearly 13 meters tall and weighs 663 tons. You have to climb up to inspect parts. You actually have to climb down. And just the sheer size of the engine itself is, uh, makes her special. Every aspect of the engine operates on a gigantic scale. The stroke of the piston alone is an amazing four and a half meters. And because Umiak-1 travels unescorted through isolated waters, the engine can never, ever be allowed to break down. When we get off in ice, if anything goes wrong with this engine, we're by ourselves. There's no other ship that can get to where we're going. Boom up, boom up, boom up. Whoa! Whoa! Yes! Up above, Kent has good news. The loading is complete. Umiak-1 is ready to leave for the Voises Bay mine. We finished just under our uh, time. We had a lot of at both perks, so uh, everything's going good. We should be, uh, should be able to get underway uh, by 8 o'clock, 20 hundred. Have you noticed to get on the go? It's enough tongue in port. We'll see how it goes day by day. Hopefully everything's going to go good. In clear weather, the journey takes about four days, but March in eastern Canada means howling winds, rough seas, and fighting through thick ice. Umiak-1 can't back down. 250 lives depend on her making it to the mine. And a $100 million cargo awaits. Loaded with critical supplies, Umiak-1 makes her way through the Gulf of St. Lawrence to a nickel mine in Labrador on Canada's east coast. She's so far away from any other sea traffic, her only company is a plane from the Canadian government's environment ministry, here to survey ice conditions. Umiak-1 takes her name from the northern Aboriginal word for a large sealskin boat, traditionally used to transport families and equipment on hunting and whaling expeditions. This modern-day Umiak moves a different kind of family and cargo. And she always travels alone, completely dependent on her one and only engine. This engine's my baby and I want to make sure she stays in top shape. Chief Engineer Gary Bishop is responsible for maintaining the largest engine in Canada. Since we haven't made it up to the ice ship, it's easy sailing at the moment. This is the time to check all of our systems out to make sure that there is no problems, because we don't want to have any problems once we hit the ice. Gary's team spends every day on the lookout for trouble. And today, third engineer Rex Domini finds it. We've got a fuel pump leaking on number three generator. Number three fuel pump. If not handled immediately, small problems can escalate into major disasters. With hot fuel in on the engine like that, it's possible we could have a fire. A little lots of fuel, we can also have a loss of power. And uh, if the standby generator doesn't respond quickly enough, we could have a blackout. Pretty good. So we'll... The crew must take the generator offline to repair the leak. Just go ahead and shut down number three. Umiak-1 relies on three diesel-powered generators to supply all of her electricity. These generators ensure that fuel keeps pumping to the engine computers keep running, and cranes keep lifting. They power everything, right down to the desk lamps. But the generators are never all used at the same time. One is always set aside as a backup. So Mike is uh, getting the generator ready to start? He's going to start up number two. All right, perfect. While one generator is shut down, another is brought online to keep the power flowing and the engine running. Gary's crew tackles the leaking fuel pump 
and the ship continues on her way, without losing a minute. Key with any of these issues is that we identify them quickly, keep everything under control. As Gary's team toils down below, the crew on the bridge prepares for an emergency drill. OK, roger that. They do this every three months. There's going to be the port side. A junior officer, Ashton Regular, will steer the ship to practice rescuing someone who's fallen overboard. A plastic boy stands in for the unlucky sailor. Ashton is at the wheel for the first time. He's a, he's a new joiner that just joined the ship uh, back in the big city. It's like taking new cars for a ride. As part of his training, the new joiner is given a big test. Ashton must execute a Williamson turn, a rescue maneuver involving extreme and sudden steering actions with the rudder to bring the ship back alongside the man overboard as quickly as possible. Watch your read. And everyone's ready. Captain Dean Rose gives the signal. OK, roger that. Get some more boats and get the, uh, get the rescue boat ready to go. At this time of year, survival in these freezing waters is measured in mere minutes. 14, 2, 2, 3, Captain. Midships. Midships. Ashton makes a textbook Williamson turn. Roger, I got a visual as well. Yeah, go ahead, Luke. It doesn't hurt that Umiak 1 is a dream to steer. To create a leap, we're going to launch the boat to get him. Roger, Captain. The ship is 630 feet long, but she turns as if she's 150 feet. It's, uh, it's quite amazing that uh, she's so maneuverable. Because of the size of the rudder, this thing turns very, very fast. This is like a Porsche compared to what I'm used to. He should be just fine on the starboard bow there now, Kent. Fine on the starboard bow. The ship and her crew have passed a big test. Should the real thing occur, they'll be ready. Day two, and Umiak 1 is about to leave the Gulf of St. Lawrence and sail through the Strait of Belle Isle, heading northwest up the Labrador coast. Now, the hard graft begins. All right, Martin, I just got the uh, latest weather and ocean information coming for our, uh, for our trip north. The ship this sails through all kinds of ice. First and second year ice, which is easy to break through. Older and tougher multi-year ice. Landfast ice, attached to the coast, and free-floating ice. The ice can range from a few centimeters thick to ridges 15 meters high. And then, of course, there are icebergs. But no matter what the form, shape, or age, Umiak 1 takes on everything that comes her way. She has a strong, uh, she's a good sea boat, and uh, she, she's made for us, so. Her hull is reinforced to ride up and crush ice ridges more than 10 meters thick. And it's coated with a special low friction paint to help ice and snow slide off. In heavy conditions, she can also spray her path with thousands of liters of water to soften the ice and snow. But even with all these defenses, ice remains a constant threat. The ship had to come up and a piece of old ice go beneath the, uh, beneath the bow of the ship. You risk, uh, you risk damaging the ship. On her second evening at sea, Umiak 1 sails into rough weather. The ice conditions that were forecasted is not close to what, uh, what we're experiencing. Moving through the narrow Strait of Belle Isle, she hits a northeasterly wind that jams chunks of ice and snow into her path, creating a bottleneck in the narrow space. So, right here is the bottleneck area. The wind is blowing this way, so everything is concentrated in this area here. Sailing through the bottleneck, the ship drags some 30 meters of ice on either side of her hull. Now right now, the snow was just zapping the speed. We're down to about five knots. Captain Rose wants to get to the mine in the next three days. At this speed, that's not going to happen. 
patience is very important when you're navigating an ice. Good evening, Captain. At midnight, evening, Chief Officer Kent Waddleton takes over for the captain. Too bad now, we start to just keep going on to it. There might be a few icebergs in around this area as well. With low visibility, icebergs in the area, and a few tons of sea ice along for the ride, it looks like Umiak 1 is in for a long, tough fight. Umiak 1 is three days away from her destination, the Voices Bay Nickel Mine in eastern Canada. The world's most powerful ice-breaking bulk carrier is about to leave open coastal waters behind and sail where only she can the ice fields off the coast of Labrador. If there's an emergency now, she's on her own. I'm just going to go up and have a look at the ice age to see if, uh, see if it's safe to proceed in. Uh, we'll reduce our speed to about six knots. Take a look, a little bit beat up, I guess, with all the wind that we've had the last couple of days. Pushing through ice makes huge demands on the ship's engine. It's already running at a standard 72 revolutions per minute, but that's not nearly enough to break through the ice. For that, Captain Dean Rose needs the ship to be running at full power, 91 RPM. Engine room ready. Yes, sir. You want 91 RPM? Okay, uh, you can take control of the room RPM, please. All right, thanks. The captain needs his icebreaker to give him all the thrust she can muster but it won't happen instantly. It's got to be done in increments to allow the engine to warm up. In open water, Umiak-1 burns about 35,000 litres of fuel a day. Ramming through ice, she burns three times that much. As the engine revs up, the effects are felt even high up on the bridge. The vibrations that you're feeling is ice going through the propeller. It's, uh, it's quite common on an icebreaker to feel that you get used to it. Umiak-1 now heads into eastern Canada's inland waters. It's minus 4 degrees Celsius outside, and 40 knot winds are battering the ship. Just another day in Labrador, I guess. Braving the weather, leading seaman Melton Keeping and his crew Head out on deck to make sure everything's still locked down. Okay, boys, check all the lashings, make sure everything's all tight. Anything loose, make sure you tighten it off. When the cargo's been double checked, Melton then inspects the ice. The ship's foredeck is just over 100 meters long, which means it's difficult for the bridge crew to get a close look. It's hard to get a, a true perspective of how thick the ice is from up here on the bridge, looking at, actually looking down on the ice. The whole bridge. <laughs> yeah, just looking at the ice situation up here, it looks like it's uh, pretty thick there. Probably two or three meters in there, some of it will break it up. Over. The ice looks like one solid slab, but it's actually a constantly shifting mass. The ship passed through here only a month ago. But the crew knows the ice is never the same twice. There's snow going, but at least we're going. Yeah, roger that, yeah. It never gets old looking at ice sometimes. Other times you wish you'd never see it again. <laughs> On her fourth day at sea, Umiak Wong gets ready to make one of the most difficult maneuvers of the entire journey. On every trip, she has to finesse her way between Whale and Skull Islands. There's less than 500 meters breathing room on each side, and hidden shoals and rocks loom all around her. If you're making the turn, something had, uh, something, uh, had to happen with your steering or your, your main engine, it's a good chance you're going to go over ground. Under watchful eyes, Umiak-1 makes the turn as nimbly as a ship half her size. The reason the ship turns so fast and is so maneuverable is because of the size of the rudder. They placed a, a very large rudder for ice navigation so the ship can turn very fast. It turns on the dome and just look. Yeah, it's going around pretty good. 20 starboard. 
Captain Rose and Chief Officer Kent Waddleton now begin their next challenge, trying to follow in their own footsteps. We have to try as much as possible to stick to our old tracking and out. This may look like empty space, but about 5,000 Inuit call this part of Canada home. Across this land, on this ice, they hunt for caribou, seals and geese. They depend on this region for their survival. So the ship must leave the smallest footprint possible. This is a line side. This is one of the old tracks running along here. It will be dark in two hours, and following the old track then will be almost impossible. So uh, to be doing that late in the day and uh, possible uh, hours of darkness is, is just not the uh, it's not a risk that we're willing to take. The nickel mine is just seven hours away. But sailing on would mean docking in the middle of the night, and it's hard enough to do by day. Captain Rose decides to stand down until tomorrow. Uh, I've been up here on the bridge uh, for 12 hours now, and uh, if we had to continue in, it would be uh, it would be just too long. We wouldn't get there before daylight anyway, so we'll shut down, get a fresh uh, fresh kick at the can tomorrow morning. He leaves the bridge in good hands. Shouldn't, uh, she shouldn't move up a wind like this. She was getting pretty good, so. Right. Great. Right. Yep, good deal. Parents, and that's what we're here for. Yeah, it's really sweltering down there. It's high as evening, and you got probably an uh, inch and a half of oil in a lot of spots down there. You have, you have to be down roll. The next morning, Captain Rose gets ready to head for the Voises Bay mine. More than $100 million worth of nickel concentrate is waiting there to be loaded and shipped back to Quebec City. As soon as we get the engine warmed up now, we'll take her on bridge control and get going. Making her way towards the mine, Umiak-1 leaves a 30-meter wide trail of broken ice. That trail cuts the hunting and fishing areas of the local Inuit people in two. So the Inuit bridge the gap. It's hard for us to hunt and fish on the south side of the track and the north side of the track. As soon as the ship has passed by, they lay down bridges that float on the newly exposed water. These are critical to sustaining the Inuit way of life. These bridges are really important to local travelers, hunters, wooders, fishers. If it wasn't there, I don't know what we would do. Five days after leaving Quebec City, Umiak One's destination is in sight. She has sailed here alone, and now she'll dock alone without any assistance from tugboats or harbor pilots. We've got no bow thruster, we can't use the anchor, and the ice is about 1.3 meters thick. So you're using 30,000 horsepower really close to the dock to try and flush the ice to get the, the ship tied alongside. 210, Eddie, that looks good. Yeah, let me know if she falls one way or another. To reach the dock, the ship needs to break up the ice blocking her approach. Captain Rose changes the engine thrust ahead and astern multiple times, pushing back and forth to clear a path. Perfect. Keep her hard to starboard. The captain's greatest weapon in this battle is the ship's 46-ton controllable pitch propeller. On this kind of propeller, the angle or pitch of the blades can be altered. When the blades change their pitch, the ship changes direction without needing to break or use a reverse gear. Okay, I'm going to let her come ahead now and, uh, and flush out a little bit if I can there. What I got broke up back here so far. And I'll, we'll work the stern back and forth then. All right, very good. A ship this big 
needs time to change direction. It takes 42 seconds roughly from, for the, uh, the pitch to go from full ahead uh, position to full astern position. So you need to keep that in mind as well when you're trying to flush the ice uh, close to the dock. Hello, Ken. I'm uh, just going to make the approach to the dock there now, Ken. I need you on the bow uh, as soon as you can there. For, uh, this. The ship is 189 meters long. The dock is only half of that, and dangerous shoals lie at each end of it. Without a bow thruster, the captain has to navigate carefully. If something had to go wrong, it doesn't, you don't have a lot of room for error. It can get pretty, pretty stressful. I just love that pretty quick here, Captain. Yeah, we're doing a, we're doing not midships. After an hour long battle, Umiak One finally makes it to the dock. How's she looking, Ken? All right, Captain, we're, uh, we're stopped. We're, uh, we're stationary here. I'll let you know if she starts creeping ahead. Even a veteran like Captain Rose is relieved at the soft landing. No injuries, no damage to any equipment. Didn't touch the dock. Nice and slow, nice and safe. Mission accomplished for the day. But as day turns to night, the hard work is far from over. Kent and his team have to unload more than 100 massive containers. They carry everything from washing machines to potatoes, anything needed to keep the nickel mine running. The ship's cargo is absolutely critical. The only road up here runs between the pier and the mine. The outside world is a plane, snowmobile or dog sled ride away. Okay, slow now, slow, slow. At three in the morning, the job is only half done. Hey, Don! I need you to take this off the dock, okay? Yeah, we got probably about five hours of uh, discharge Fine. left to go. So uh, the guys are going to keep going to Detroit tonight. We don't stop here. Uh, once we get in there and get going, it's just 24 hour operation until everything is done. By dawn, Umiak is almost unloaded, and trucks have begun to haul the cargo to the mine. In this part of Canada, the morning traffic is light. Thirteen kilometers from the port, the Voises Bay workers mine one of the planet's most precious metals, nickel. 365 days a year, from frigid winter to blistering summer, the mine never stops. This is the reason Umiak One was designed and built. It can travel here year round, and uh, that's primarily what we need. In a year, the miners dig up a million tons of ore. From that, they extract around 360,000 tons of nickel concentrate. The annual haul is worth billions of dollars. And Umiak One is at the very heart of this operation. Everything we produce goes out on Umiak. Basically, we survived with that boat. Nickel is used to make stainless steel. It's precious cargo, but it can also be very dangerous. This type of nickel concentrate is self-heating. If there's too much oxygen in the hold, the nickel could ignite. To prevent this from happening, nitrogen gas is pumped into the hold. This displaces the oxygen through a vent in the hatch cover. No oxygen, no fire. The first cargo hold has now been filled with nickel concentrate. Wait, uh, they just called for the N2 plant. They get a generator going. And, uh, it's time to displace the oxygen inside with nitrogen gas. Down below, the engineers start pumping. The gas levels will be monitored for the duration of the return journey. So I got one compressor running there now. 
As the loading continues, the captain learns he can expect rough seas ahead. I just got the long-term forecast coming earlier today. There it looks like uh, by the time we finish up, it's, uh, there's going to be a storm coming up. So expect another bit of uh, rolling around on the way down. We're well used to it. Nobody likes it, but uh, when it happens, we uh, hope for the best. Forewarned is forearmed. Umiak One and her crew prepare to sail right into a vicious North Atlantic storm. It's almost four in the morning. Umiak One is fully loaded with more than $100 million worth of nickel concentrate and is almost ready to depart for Quebec City. Leaving the dock is a little bit more difficult than actually making the dock. The moment Captain Dean Rose pulls away from the dock, he'll be confronted by a dangerous shoal just 200 meters away. He hopes that by leaving now, during flood tide, he'll have the space he needs to clear it. Let's see if I can flush out a bit of ice as we come ahead. The tide is rising now, so it gives us a little bit more water under the keel. But even with a storm on the way, the captain can't rush. Speed is the key thing here, that if you're going too fast and you hit the rudder with a huge piece of ice, and it's possible you could actually damage your rudder and damage your steering. Just coming ahead there now, Ken. I got a good clip on going to turn so yeah, right. Once again, Captain Rose relies on his variable pitch propeller to move his ship back and forth in this tight space. All right, we're good to go now. You ready to go? We're ready to go. Is it flushing back? Captain Rose has pulled away from this dock hundreds of times, but it never gets any easier. I'll come to stern on her. What's wrong? Is it breaking up? Come to stern. Come to stern, very good. Free of the dock, Umiak One finds her old track and begins the four day trip back to Quebec City. But with a storm ahead, the captain can't let his guard down. It's a never ending battle of worry on board. So hopefully uh, Lady Luck is with us a little bit today, but I got a feeling that uh, there's going to be a bit of swell week. You're not going to outrun it at all. For the next seven hours, Umiak enjoys calm seas. When we get the chance, we always like to come out and see, you know, see it all the ice and I mean, it's a beautiful day out, and we don't, there's no windows down the ends where I tell you that. On the bridge, the captain is still thinking about what lies beyond the ice. As soon as we get outside of the edge, I got a feeling that uh, it's really going to turn nasty. I can see the cloud coverage just off the, uh, off the horizon. Little uh, small piece there, one on the board, Captain. Small piece there. Azumiak One heads into open water. The crew braces for the waiting storm. Probably rolled a little. Yeah. Those sensors are mostly on the end. On day two of the return voyage, a message comes through from head office. First job is the uh, prepare the ballast tanks. He wants to confirm the location of a sensor in the ballast tank. Umiak One is scheduled to undergo special maintenance back in Quebec City, and the repair crew will need to know exactly where this sensor is located. Prevent any back injuries. Manhole lifting logs will be used. So we're not going to get a chance to do it tomorrow. The weather's not great today. Well, this is the only time we're going to get a chance to do it, so. We ready to rumble? The captain and chief officer Kent Waddleton prepare to descend the 16 meters to the floor of the tank. Equipped with gas detectors, emergency breathing devices, a first aid kit, and extra lights. If either man is injured or passes out, you have to be carried up several ladders from the confined space below. A tough assignment, especially in this weather. You got seas coming over on the uh, port side there now. If they start rushing over on this side, we're going to get wet and water's going to come down through, so we got to get this done. For the crew on deck, there's nothing to do but wait and hope nothing goes wrong below. The floor is slippery. The ladders are ice cold, and the ship is rolling hard. Okay. The sensor is between uh, 
whip frame 135 and 136, and he is 30 centimeters, 3 zero centimeters from the uh, whip frame 136. 30 centimeters from 136. It's time to get back on deck before the weather gets even worse. It's gonna close up, us. It was borderline, borderline to get done today, so I'm glad it's done and over with. I don't think we'll be doing the other side, not today. No, no definitely not. With, this, with the rolling and the swell, it's, uh, yeah. it's making it too slippery and too dangerous to be down there. But despite the rough seas, there's still work to be done, and one job is critical. The oxygen and nitrogen levels in the cargo holds have to be checked. Once again, Kent does the honours. Hello, Kent. Okay, we're uh, we're hitting uh, 156 there now. She seems to be pretty good. She's only if the oxygen level is too high, the nickel concentrate in the hold could catch fire. There are four different cargo holds to be checked, and Kent has to get the job done before nightfall. Moving around a wet deck in the dark is too dangerous. Yeah, Martin, now somebody uh, keep an eye on Kent as he, as he goes out. All right. Plugging into the first sensor port, Kent's gas detector reads the oxygen level. Anything over 8% is cause for concern. This reading is safe, just under 3%. Hello, Dale. Just write these on Kent the is now joined by seaman Eddie Blackmore. Let's see what the starboard side of there, Eddie. One more. Number five. 7.8. But in cargo hold five, the oxygen level is pushing the limit. Now we got some surf action here, Eddie. Kent suspects a leak in one of the nitrogen lines yes. that should be displacing the oxygen. Good. He's right. He calls the engine room to have the escaping gas turned off. Hello, engine room. Yeah, okay, you're gonna have to shut down the, uh, the nitrogen, please. Shut down the nitrogen. This gives the repair crew time to deal with the problem before it gets too serious. Okay, Roger, Derek, you can shut it down. We're good. For the moment, there's enough nitrogen in the hole to last until the line can be fixed tomorrow. Okay, that's it, Eddie. We'll uh, shut the delivery there and we'll. Uh... We'll get inside, get in after deck. It takes a tough breed to work in these conditions. Sir, look at that. Who else can do this if you're all day long? Who's just clowning around? Some people's cut out for it, some people's not. This boy works sailors. This swell coming over. That's what he's made for. This was all about. This where you come to the sailor. Make the sailor out of a sailor. Make the man out of you. Day five of the return, Quebec City beckons on the horizon. It's always a good feeling knowing that you're, you're in port safe and sound. Cargo's all good, no damages to the ship or the cargo, so mission complete. There's just time for a crew photo. All right, let's get lined up, I guess. Who are we waiting on now? They don't complain, they've got to work in sub-zero temperatures all the time, a 12-hour day. It's a tough job, it really is. But uh, they seem to do it and, and more so enjoy it. <laughs> it's a good feeling to be on the ship where the crew are happy and motivated and uh, the job is getting done. In Quebec City, Umiak 1 will unload 30,000 tons of nickel concentrate, worth over $100 million. Then she'll load up once again for the next voyage to the mine. No matter what the weather throws at her, 
the world's most powerful ice-breaking bulk carrier, will continue to do the one job for which she was built, keeping this remote corner of Canada alive. Umiak-1 is the lifeline to a remote nickel mine on Canada's east coast. And the mine desperately needs supplies. This ship has to get there. It's a never-ending battle, a worry on board. Fighting through storms and swells, she'll return with a $100 million cargo. If something had to go wrong, you don't have a lot of money for air. Out here in the ice, Umiak-1 is on her own. Umiak-1 is the most powerful ice-breaking bulk carrier in the world. Driven by the largest single engine in Canada, she sails just one route, the 2,100 kilometers between Quebec City and the Voises Bay Nickel Mine in northeastern Labrador. From Quebec, she brings the supplies needed to sustain the miners and keep the mine working. Then she returns again, loaded with up to 30,000 tons of nickel concentrate, a haul worth more than $100 million. She makes this round trip at least once a month, no matter what the weather. Every journey is a heavy duty obstacle course for Captain Dean Rose. We're up here operating about uh, four or five months in the winter out of a year, so the guys are used to the cold, they don't mind it. And uh, they do a good job, a really good job. In 2006, Captain Rose was first officer. Umiak-1 is the lifeline to a remote nickel mine on Canada's east coast. And the mine desperately needs supplies. This ship has to get there. It's a never-ending battle of worry on board. Fighting through storms and swells, she'll return with a $100 million cargo. If something had to go wrong, you don't have a lot of money for air. Out here in the ice, Umiak-1 is on her own. Umiak-1 is the most powerful ice-breaking bulk carrier in the world. Driven by the largest single engine in Canada, she sails just one route, the 2,100 kilometers between Quebec City and the Voises Bay Nickel Mine in northeastern Labrador. From Quebec, she brings the supplies needed to sustain the miners and keep the mine working. Then she returns again, loaded with up to 30,000 tons of nickel concentrate, a haul worth more than $100 million. She makes this round trip at least once a month, no matter what the weather. Every journey is a heavy duty obstacle course for Captain Dean Rose. We're up here operating about uh, four or five months in the winter out of a year, so the guys are used to the cold, they don't mind it. And uh, they do a good job, a really good job. In 2006, Captain Rose was first officer on Umiak-1's maiden voyage. Four years later, he was given command. 